Uh, welcome to our Beastmaster event. Uh, my name is Jeff Bond. Uh, please welcome uh, composer Lee Holdridge. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, I'm should... the original Beastmaster, right? <laughs> right, exactly. You know, that's me. That, that, that's actually me. That's what I used to look like. Yeah, that's right. Well, the most <laughs> incredible composer body sculpting <laughs> ever, ever. Special effects, what can I say? Uh, th th this uh, comes from uh, a huge, like not just a period of uh, science fiction and fantasy films, but like a whole year. There was uh, oh, this yeah. is so <laughs> often considered like the greatest year in mm -hmm. f fantasy and science fiction movies, and you were kind of in the middle of this. Uh, so tell me how you got involved uh, with with Beastmaster, and, and it's I think people might think that this was like a ripoff of Conan the Barbarian. It came out a few months afterwards, but I have to assume it was well into production and being made while Conan was being made. I think made. they were both kind of going on at the same time, and there were other films, too, that were very similar. It's all of a sudden, everybody caught on to that subject. It's a great subject for films. Come on, I mean, you know, it's just totally, I mean, it's, it's never going to stop. You know, they're going to be making those kind of films forever. But uh, I got a phone call one day from Don Coscarelli, the director, and he said, I just heard your violin concerto. You're perfect for my film. And I was thinking, oh, great, I must be a elegiac, romantic, you know, <laughs> kind of film. And I, I found out it was the Beastmaster, and I'm sitting there saying, what did he hear in my concerto that made him think of the Beastmaster? But I said, I'm not asking questions. You know, you know how it is, composers. You say, oh, yeah, sure, great, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> but I think he heard something that he liked in that, and he literally just hired me on the spot. And they threw this film at me, and the good news was I got hired. The bad news was we need the score in two weeks. Whoa. And uh, I said, OK. So <laughs> I, 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 and we're doing it in Rome, because Cam Music is going to pay for the score. Cam Music is Ennio Morricone's company in Italy. They have a studio, and he has access to the Rome Symphony in the Orchestra Santa Cecilia. And I said, okay, that's very exciting, but that means we have to go there to record. <laughs> that takes a day or two out of the schedule. So I wound up 10 days working like a maniac. I got some wonderful, incredible help from Greg McRitchie, the legendary orchestrator, who had worked for Alfred Newman and worked on Conan also. So I kept saying to him, how did you get those low? He said, oh, we use this and we use that. I said, okay, I know what to <laughs> And, um, he told me stories, composers, you'd love this. He said that in Alfred Newman's day, if they made a picture change, the composer would get another two weeks. And I said, those days went away fast. <laughs> they just are gone, you know. But, uh, you know, you just kind of fasten your seatbelt. And it was, a f it was a fun movie. I mean, I liked it right from the get-go. I was very dazzled by everything Don did. I knew it was a tight budget. But I, was, I couldn't believe what it looked like, you know, what he did. And I would ask him questions in the spotting. I said, well, um, the guy says we leave at dawn. And then, you know, three minutes later they arrive. What, what, what happens? And he, he looked at me and said, you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the answer. <laughs> yeah, it, the, the spotting on the film is, is interesting. I mean, yeah. I was watching it and... Uh, you know, watching like there's a scene where he falls into quicksand. Yeah. And I was like, well, there would be quicksand music, and it, now yeah. uh, that, that, uh, there's a lot of interesting choices. Like you, you, you know, you've got a theme for these two ferrets. The ferrets, right? But right. They, they, it's not like when the ferrets appear, make their first appearance, they get their theme. They get yeah. their theme when they go into action to right, help right, the right, hero. Right, right. Well, I was trying to look for, you know, I mean, when you don't have a lot of time, you don't really have time to think about it. You just I used to say to my friend Alf Clausen, I said, just close your eyes and write. You know, don't worry about it, just go, you know. Because you just never know when you when the schedules are really tight. But uh, a lot of it was the director. I mean he had he he's very musical and he had very strong ideas about what he wanted. There was a producer, a foreign producer involved, who kept saying to me, Lee, I want boom boom. I want boom boom. Boom, boom. So 
when I went to Rome and we were going to do the main title, I had talked to the orchestra contractor and the percussion guys. I said, find me the largest bass drum you have in your life. And they brought it to the studio. It was this thing. It looked like, I think it marched with the Roman legions. I think it was that old. You know, and when he hit it, the dust went all over it. You know? <laughs> but that's what you hear at the beginning here. And I looked over, and this producer had a big grin on his face. <laughs> I said, he got his boom boom. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you because you have that, but the, you know the theme. If they were thinking at all about oh, we want to have the you know this mm -hmm. sound like Conan, you don't go in that direction no, at no, all with no, the, that no, main no, title. It's no, very yeah. warm and romantic. Well, I think I think I like the idea that the the rhythmic aspect of the main title, but it also it's lifting. And because of who he was as a character, I felt that because he was sort of a champion of good and he, he talked with the animals and he had all, everything on his side, you know, I said, you know, he is a very hero kind of character. And in the end, you should, you should kind of go up with him. You, know, you, should, mm -hmm. you should ascend, as it were. And I wanted the theme to do that. You know, so. Yeah, and you, have, you also have to write the literally ascending music for the, the, this kind of eagle flight yeah, yeah. that's recurrent. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, he, you know, he wanted, I didn't, I had that, that theme for the eagle, but that works as a nice uh, counterbalance to the, to the opening titles. That was kind of the, the counter theme. The two went back and forth. And I saw his, his relationship with the eagle as, by the way, they dyed the eagle sort of brown. By the way, that's why he looks that way. They want that was Don. He wanted. He said, "I don't want an eagle. I want a brown-looking thing." So that's <laughs> this poor eagle had to go to makeup every day. <laughs> yeah, they did. I mean, they do the same thing. They wanted a black panther, and they yeah, get right. a black exactly, panther. So they exactly, exactly, the, exactly. The, it's like the, the it's a black panther, but it has like a white you yeah, know I mouth. I always uh, uh, I I was always thinking like the people you know painting that tiger yeah. every day. They, if they get to the mouth, and be like, oh, "That's okay. He yeah. looks it's, <laughs> he looks great." <laughs> You know, directors have very specific things that they visualize for their films, and you have to go with that. You have to, and they they see things a certain way. And I think, I don't know, that, that was his idea. He wanted the animals to look like that. I'm like, hey, whatever, you know, it's great. And you know, it's funny. At the time, you're doing the film, you record it, you haven't slept in you know two or three weeks. You, you collapse, you know, and the next thing. You, Somebody calls you 10 years later and says, you know, it's a cult film. You say, it is? <laughs> yeah, this movie, I mean, you had so much to play with, you know, visually and just the, sort of the ideas. Mm -hmm. is it, is oh, it like Carl? Yeah. No, no, no. We're okay. uh, the, I, I, you know, I remember, you know, actually being disappointed watching Conan because, to, you know, when I saw it in theaters originally because... It was seemed to me it was like all sword, no sorcery. There was the, there wasn't a lot of exotic, yeah. uh -huh. crazy stuff. Yeah. It was like you know, De Laurentiis is like all he could afford was a snake. You know, it's like <laughs> King King Kong, he just gives you a snake, a and snake, then the, yeah, the yeah, same yeah. thing in, in Conan. But yeah. this movie yeah. had some amazing visual stuff in it. The the, the whole sequence right. when they're moving right. the. Uh, the it, you know unborn infant from uh, his mother into yeah. a cow. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is uh, you know th that, there's yeah, the know kind of glowing yeah. uh, poison they right. put on on their necks. There's mm -hmm. um, the uh, the whole idea of the yeah. animals right, and that right, the right. powers you have to work with. Yeah. There's these. Bat, the Batman. Bat they put the arms uh, the, around them. You turn back. into soup. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it, I mean, it, and the the, yeah. the, the the witch, you know, mm -hmm. climbing up the, mm -hmm. the ceiling. Mm -hmm. the I mean, there's some incredibly imaginative yeah. stuff yeah. in this. Well, again, this is his. This was his. You know, his. He basically created this thing. I think it's his script uh, too, isn't it? Or he yeah, he co-wrote it. it. He co-wrote it. Yeah. So he really envisioned this. You know, and I, I was very fortunate because he happened to be a music lover. You know, and uh, so. He was an ally to me. You know, he kept saying, "I want the music to do this here and do this here and do this here." And th I said, "Yeah, I'm writing notes as fast as I can." You know, and uh, uh, I had to do it, and I did it fast. But I love this the stuff. He pushed me a certain way, and that, that was great. I, that's what you look for. You know, what, what do you remember him talking about in terms of like treating uh, some of the specific things like the the Batman, the the, the and the the the, the kind of horde? There's basically 
you know, Rip Torn's mm -hmm, villain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is this uh, these this kind of Mongol yeah. hordes who <laughs> yeah. come in it, at the beginning the and at the end, the Jones, and the, yeah. the Batman. The, all, yeah. all of the you yeah. had to create like a dark, kind yeah. of different. No, dark no, no. He he wanted that, but I, I, like I said, we didn't have a lot of time. He left some of it up to me, but he told me specifically, he said, I, I want this to happen here, I want this to happen here. He said, give me a beautiful theme for the eagle, you know, that kind of stuff. And then he said, go write. <laughs> you know? Right, right. So that's what you do, you know. And, and uh, by the way, the, the stunt man told me that that eagle was very lazy. He would only fly downwards. So they would take him way up <laughs> on this top high tower, <laughs> and they would release him, and he'd make these circles. <laughs> And they, they put the camera at certain angles, you know. The, those of you shooting, you know what, they the, probably know what they're talking about. So it looked like he was going up, you know, but he was just going down. And the eagle was like, where can I land? Enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> I love stuff like that, you know. And then when you see the movie, you're like, wow. And Don kept saying to me, he said, with music, they'll think he's flying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you thinking of, uh, I think, there, are they the, the Juns? And yeah, the, yeah. They're not the Huns, they're the Juns. The Juns, yeah. Uh, the, for, for their kind of motif, were you thinking at all of the, the Dies Irae? A little bit. There's that it's drum, a, that drum. I, I thought a little bit of Stravinsky crept in there, maybe, possibly, you know. You, you can't help it. You know, I, I grew up in a symphonic world like many of you, and, you know, all this great stuff is around you, so if you kind of a little bit here and a little bit there, that's, that's what... But I can go through... Beethoven and Mozart and Brahms and show you where they kind of listen to stuff, you know, yeah. so it's, it's just the natural thing that you do as a composer. You're influenced by what's around you and certain things that affect you and you think about, well, you know, I like what so-and-so did with that, you know, maybe something along those lines. And when you're in a hurry, you do that a little more than often. <laughs> well, it's funny because the, the, I mean, there are many movies that very explicitly yeah. reference yeah. the the SE rate. This do, doesn't yeah, really. No, it's, it's, it's just, just like almost the first invention. couple of notes that yeah. goes off. So oh, I think my, most people would need make the yeah. connection. But you know, I can go to a, a big blockbuster movie nowadays, and I know what they tempt the movie with, <laughs> because I hear the composer struggling to write something just like the temp, but avoid a lawsuit. And it's embarrassing, and it's terrible what that does to you. And they didn't have time to tempt this movie, so they kind of turned me loose on it. You know what I'm saying? And that was a big advantage for me, because I wasn't being told it has to be this way. It was like, well, something like this, something like that. Do something over here, do something over here. And I really, I, I really believe that, in a sense, I, I wanted to see, like I said earlier, this sort of ascent. This, this man that is reaching for a higher plateau, and that's what powers the whole thing. And all the dark stuff, that's just, that's just fun. You know, you just write the darkest music you can write, you know, you say, get those string clusters down there, you know, and all those drums, and just throw it in there, and it all works, you know? Uh, what were you using for this? Uh, I don't know whether it's an electronic or something. There's a that, little that, bit, yeah. Uh, the a birth little bit, scene. Yeah, there's a little bit in there. We had, to, we had to sort of kind of overdub that a little bit because they didn't really have that in the orchestra in Rome, but we added it in a little bit, you know, put some electronics on it. And, and you have a beautiful love theme. You don't really mm -hmm. get to use mm -hmm. it a mm -hmm. lot, but no. the, it's a very, very, almost like a madrigal, like medieval yeah. kind of yeah. theme. Uh, that, again, that was, he said, write, write a beautiful theme for her, you know, and I thought that, that kind of renaissance-y, you know, thing would fit. I don't know why. You, you never know what period these movies are in. You know, you say, what year is that? So, Shh. <laughs> Same thing with Conan. What year is that? <laughs> 857 yeah, BC? Yeah, it's the I mean, another thing that uh, struck me about this movie is they uh, you know, you have an, a fantastic villain in Rip Torn. Oh. <laughs> and and the, there's a scene where uh, that's a, a um, White knuckle, amazing scene where he's they he's sacrificing the second kid. You watch him throw a, kid, a little kid yeah, into I the know. flames, and then he calls up for another one. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, they build this whole sequence. Yeah. Like, you know, you have your eagle circling right, and right. the beastmaster trying to do, but he's like a, a thousand feet away from this yeah, guy, I and know. then they they actually throw this kid in. He's uh, like 
being shoved yeah. down into this pit of flame. I mean, oh, it has like a cr cr you know, like flesh what crawling. It, I think Don read some of those Mayan Aztec legends, you know, about throwing people in these temples. You know, they would throw people in. That's if you ever read any Mayan history, it's pretty bloody and awful. You know, they would throw people into in down pits and stuff in temples. So, I think he vaguely was kind of referring to that a little bit. You know. Uh, Creeps me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, what, the, what's what's really amazing about the movie too is they they set up. You know, the, he's really one of the most fiendish villains yeah. you could possibly have, but they kill him before the climax well. of the movie. <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, I, I you know, I was going to ask you, uh, yeah. and I, I didn't even realize how little time you had to uh, write this. So I'm sure, like you know, architecture was probably the last thing. On your yeah. mind, but when you know the st the standard thing when you're doing this kind of score is you key in on like the death of the villain, and that's yeah, going to be a yeah, huge yeah, moment yeah. for you. So you you had another gi whole gigantic battle scene to f score yeah, after the, that. The big battle with the the horde that comes and that that big finale that that is kind of the bat last big moment of the film, and that thing that he did in slow motion was fantastic for music. I thought you know, mm -hmm. and and uh, I just literally pulled all the stops out there. And I love the way the film goes into the ending from there, and it's very lifting, and he goes up into the mountains, and she follows him, and you know, mm -hmm. the whole thing. Also, uh, very touching when the one ferret dies, Yeah, you know? Yeah. I cried. He sacrificed <laughs> his life. I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> that little guy. Well, I, yeah, even earlier too, when it, the, the quicksands, they yeah. pull the ferret down into quick. I was like, "Where's the you?" you and that's I wonder if the animal people were. I don't know. There's. Yeah. I noticed they they have the usual thing about yeah, that, but they yeah. didn't say no animals were harmed. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that. I'm sure they were. Animals were at least un severely annoyed. Well, they yeah. <laughs> making this film. I love that. <laughs> that's great. Um, uh, that's uh, you know the the ending too. It's such yeah. a complicated. Uh, you've got these the the, the, mm -hmm. the Juns and then mm -hmm. the Batman come yeah. in, and yeah. say, so you really have to. Yeah. Uh, that was so interesting to me because you have to bring back mm -hmm. this this kind of disturbing music for for the Batman because of the yeah. they're frightening yeah. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Know, characters yeah. 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 initially, and then you have to. Basically, underscore the fact that they're heroic now well, to save the characters. There's a noble moment in the score when he looks up and he sees the Batman, and it's kind of like, you know, we owe you, you mm -hmm. know, we're loyal to you. And that this, I played that. I said, you got to play the loyalty because they are coming back and paying a debt back to him. And then there's. <laughs> Crunching everybody to death. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you get this heroic moment and you go, Rah. I think, you know, pro people probably assume this was the first kind of epic sounding score that you you may have done. And, uh, I, I, you know, I talked to you about this mm. earlier, mm. but the, the, the thing, the first music I ever heard from you was uh, the score to Jonathan Livingston Seagull, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. which is a, another very unusual yeah. uh, project. Yeah. And this was like 1973, but it yeah. also has like a, a, an incredible uh, like first flight yes. to one of the yeah. most exciting pieces of music yeah. like from, from my childhood. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. it's, it's got a very epic quality to yes. it. Yes, well, I, I ha it's been one area that's been good for me is the epic sort of quality. There is a movie of mine called The Pack, which is not well known. It's an early Warner Brothers film where I did try out a lot of horror stuff. It was about an island that was ruled by a pack of dogs and was attacking everybody on the island. Right. And um, there was a lot of really stirring, you know, dark music in that. And that kind of got my chops going a little bit, you know, and uh, uh, in terms of what to do for that kind of stuff, you know. So I've been, I've lurked around it, you know what I'm saying, but you don't get asked to do those things a lot. But Well, what happened after, you know, Beastmaster, I don't think it, w it was not a huge success when it no, was originally it wasn't. released, eventually became a cult film, but did, did, right, you, yeah. did you get work, I, I, shortly after that, I think you did Wizards and Warriors, a TV yeah, show. Yeah, uh, so Wizards and Warriors was a, for that? yeah, Wizards and Warriors was a complete, uh, Valentine to Eric Wolfgang called Cornwall. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, and those guys, you know, I mean, that's all that was. And the producer of that loved that music, and he said, I'll write you some of that music. <laughs> you know, and that's what that is. 
But I don't see the necessarily the kinship. Beastmaster was kind of in its own thing. If anything, I see the Beauty and the Beast TV series that came soon right. after that, kind of having some elements. But uh, you know, I don't know. You, they, like you said, the movie wasn't a success right away. It was ten years later. Somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said it's a cult film, and I said, it, "It's what? <laughs> <laughs> it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, wow. It, they, I was reading that the, they, they showed it so much on like TNT, and yeah, they just right. called it the Beastmaster Channel." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I did remember that there was that period where it was on TNT every week, you know. They were, they were, were, you, were you ever approached to do the sequel? There was talk about it, but then the, all the producers, the whole thing changed and the different companies. Yeah, the Cosmo Corelli had nothing it, it to was, do with it. It. Was, it was all like weird. Right. I never thought it was quite as good. There's another, uh, does anyone here have the score to uh, Into Thin Air? Okay, yeah, this, this is yeah. my favorite yeah. work by you, and well, it, it's a uh, it's a score for a TV movie about people climbing Mount Everest and like uh, uh, this huge disaster yeah, that yeah. happened. Yeah, but that is, uh, I mean, every bit as epic, if not more epic, I think than than mm -hmm. uh, Beastmaster. It, it's it's an incredible recording. I'm not even sure how it would have happened because it's a TV movie. Well. They did want an orchestra, and they did give me uh, uh, 60 pieces in London, members of the Philharmonia Orchestra, which is one of the top orchestras in the world. But the budget was tight, so one of the beauties of that CD, if you can get it, uh, if you're an audiophile, that orchestra was recorded basically with some stereo mics and some overheads, and that's what's on the CD. There's no tracking nothing. What you hear is literally like a live performance right off the floor. And the engineer did a brilliant job of capturing it. And that CD is amazing because it's literally, you see the orchestra sitting right there. And what I heard on the podium is what you hear in that orchestra. And there were no baffles, nothing in the room, you know. And uh, I had a lot of fun in that because we used these Tibetan gongs and the percussionists at the at the Philharmonia love this. Oh yes, we call them nipple gongs <laughs> because you know they have the little. So I said, that nipple gong. Do you have a one in the key of C? Do you have a C? Yeah, this was this nipple gong is in C. He loved this. <laughs> This went on all day long. That's I was watching, you know, Everest, uh, which is like got you know three thousand times the budget of that yeah. TV movie, and yeah. I just kept thinking, geez, I wish this had the uh, score well, to well, into thin air in it. Well. That, that it's got this kind. I mean, it, it, somehow you created the idea of like the effort mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm, of climbing mm -hmm, the mountain, mm -hmm. and it's incredibly percussive, and the, the, yes. it's got this fantastic rhythm. Yeah. That drives through these cues and the, right. this incredible cue when they actually reach the summit. Oh yes, uh, yeah. it, it's amazing. I mean, if you guys like uh, you know, <laughs> the Beastmaster, you have to have this. Yeah, the and it's incredible. it's fun to listen to because there's like no edit. It's clean. It's totally just the recording, naked as it were. Yeah, it is a, a yeah. thunderous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's interesting well. thing about certain directors, you know, like Don Coscarelli directed this, and my friend Robert Markowitz, who directed Into Thin Air, and I did Tuskegee Airmen with him. He doesn't believe in temp scores. He gives you the film naked. So if you play a note, he's, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, you like that, huh? <laughs> but the, the marvelous thing about that is being able to say, OK, you just have to create. Whereas if you get a film with a temp score on it and they say, this is what I want, you sit there and you're haunted by something else, you know? And it's very difficult, it's very difficult. But Into Thin Air, Tuskegee Airmen, Beastmaster, these were films that I came to a blank canvas. And just the director being a cheerleader and saying, I want this. Robert Markowitz, big classical music lover, big film score lover, loves all the great classics, and he would say to me, I want, you know, this is what I want here, and I want here, and I want this to soar over here. And I remember him saying to me, the first time in Tuskegee Airmen, the, the, the guys go into a, the, the guy goes into a dog fight, he says, 
what can you do musically that changes somehow? So this, this is the first time he's in a dog fight. What do you think? And he threw that at me. He said, think about it. You know? And I went home and I said, serial music, 12-tone music. I haven't used it yet. It changes at that point. So you say harmonically, it's a subtle thing, but if you're saying the guy's gone into a different place. You know? But I love directors that challenge you like that because that pushes you out the window, so to speak, and say, go do something different. <laughs> Who, uh, 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 what kind of inspired you to actually get into uh, scoring movies? And was there anyone you saw as a, a role model or an inspiration? Well, I, was, I grew up in Costa Rica, and I was studying violin, and I was, wanted to be a classical composer. But my mother took me to the movies all the time. And I, they, I saw all the great movies, everything from Ben Hur to, you know, whatever. And you just sit there, wow. Sounds fantastic, you know. So that it's it's always there. I I studied in in Boston and New York, and I was more going towards the concert world. I did some op operatic writing and some ballet writing and everything. And then this guy approached me one day. He had done a ten minute film, and so I I did some music for him. And the next thing you know, the bug bites you. You know. But I used to haunt the uh, old theaters in New York and go to the New Yorker theater and see like. Uh, Alan Tru uh, uh, Truffaut, uh, Francois Truffaut f festivals and s stuff like that, and I was always marveling at the scores that were uh, that Georges Delarue did, four, five, six, maybe a small chamber group, and they were marvelously evocative, and they have great little thematic things, and they were quirky, like shoot the piano player, don't shoot the piano player, that uh, that score, and that sticks with you, and that you, 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 that goes with you as you think about it, you know. Yeah, he. Um, people always think of him for those kind of small little, yeah. like uh, of yeah. all the like scores. But yeah. he could. All, he did a couple yeah, of he, epic. He, he, uh, he did, did a he couple did. of medieval yeah, things absolutely. that didn't sound absolutely. Absolutely. terrific. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, anybody have any questions for Lee Holdridge? You, sir. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, Jack Bender is the director of that, was, was a good friend of mine. We had done a number of, of TV movies together. And we had a great, great rapport. We, we worked really well together. And he did call me and said, I'm doing this marvelous movie. I want you to do the music. I mean, so I was on board right from the beginning, which was very fortunate. And uh, loved the movie. I just loved the movie. And, uh, you know, you can't but help me. You know, have Harold Arlen's ghosts staring at you from uh, the other side of the world, but you know the movie was different because it was not about the it's about the guy that wrote it and about what he went through. So I had a lot of fun with that, a lot of fun with that, and it was very beautiful, very touching. And again, Jack, Jack I've been very fortunate. Jack Bender loved music. He loves music. So when you get to work for with a director that loves music, they really sort of they make you feel good. They make you, you want to write. You say do something really beautiful for this and he would say make me cry here you know <laughs> like the Dorothy the little girl you know and he said make me cry here and man you know I spent days on those eight bars you know <laughs> where was it recorded that was here that was here uh, it was at the old remember there used to be a studio on uh, the old CBS lot it's gone now you know at, uh, uh, at studio in Studio Radford. City Radford thank you they're gone What's going on? Why are these studios disappearing? It's not a good thing. Anyone else? Splash. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I love Splash. I love Splash. I mean, that still to me is a, one of the best romantic comedies that anybody ever did. And I'm going to tell you something. I really think, you know, I see a lot of romantic comedies, and what they're missing is the, the writing, the script. The writing in that is absolute gem when you think about it right from the get-go every bit of dialogue every bit it's all the same guys wrote night shift which is another one it's a, it's a hysterical hysterical script but i think it makes a huge difference and i mean that movie was so well done so well put together uh, they didn't use all my score for it you know they were very sort of anti they were a little anti-music uh, yeah a little bit so it's weird Talk a little bit about the little animated return to the world of barbarians. 
Korgoth. Korgoth. Yeah. It's on YouTube. You yeah, it's on YouTube. It's a it's a little bit of a, a cartoon version of Beastmaster, you know. Right. <laughs> That's kind of very strange. More rock and roll, you know. I had some guys come in and play electric guitar on it and everything and stuff, so it sounds that way. Yeah. It's a good little score. Oh, thank you. Thank you. A lot of people don't know that I could do that stuff. I said, you know, I did have a little bit of a rock and roll era before Neil Diamond when I was kind of a rocker. But I don't like to tell people about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Not this crowd. <laughs> I'm curious on something like Beastmaster where you have crazy time pressure. Yes. And your stuff is so thematically distinctive and to me just sort of delightfully tuneful. But committing to, you know, these notes in this order and then start writing and how yeah. tough is it to know mm. you know, it's it's good mm -hmm. enough, it's it's right enough. How do you write at that? Oh and gosh, I, I don't know. I, you, you, you have to really, you know, I've been composing since I was 10 years old. You know, I mean, this is like breathing to me. Composing, I mean, I, I drive in on, on the freeway now and I'm, you know, things are going through my head all the time. Uh, it's, a, it's a very natural process to me to compose. It really is. And, uh, you know, it's even more fun when there's a film because now you put your focus on it. You know, I got to tell you, it's tough when somebody says write a concert work. I say, about what? <laughs> you just have to make it up. But a film helps you. And like I said, these directors are great because they give you little things that they want. But I was just jazzed with Beastmaster. I was just having a good time with it. And you know, you got to make the timings. Things have to change. Things have to hit. But they don't know. Didn't always hit. They were they were still editing a little bit. You know. So I just said, oh well, it'll work out in the wash, you know. But it did. But things like, you know, that when he does the sword and, the, you know, the orchestra, it's like he's conducting the orchestra. <laughs> that scene where he's up on the cliff, you know, it just kind of worked out. But I just watched him and, you know, I made sure the tempo went with, with him, you know. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the uh, Long Way Home? Now, the Long Way Home is a very beautiful, touching film. Um, I, I don't want to keep boring you guys, but the, they, they had a composer for that film, and they were not happy. And I have to quote the rabbi, he says, can't you find me someone who could write a melody? <laughs> 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 so, I don't know, through various sources, I came on the scene. And uh, I, I wrote that opening sequence. I played it for them on the piano, and they loved it. And who knew that film would win an Academy Award? You know, I mean, it's like Billy Crystal had that great line that he was the host that year and when Rabbi Heyer and Rick Trank went up to accept the Academy Award for that film. Billy Crystal said, "Even my rabbi is winning Oscars. What's going on here?" <laughs> I always remember that. Uh, so I, I think we've got another montage yeah, to show, right? The scene he was referring to where okay. Dar's, Dar's like doing right, right, montage. Right, right, right. Okay. Sure. <laughs> that, that ascending four chord thing, I use that all through the film. That and the, there's a four note thing, bomb, bomb, that at the beginning of that sequence, that, uh, you know, you, you, you take things like that. It's like a symphony, like writing a symphony. You, you, you take building blocks that you have and then you bring them back and then you elaborate on them and then maybe you reverse them and you do all that stuff. All my friends, Dmitry Shostakovich and Bela Bartok, they all did that, and Hindemith and all the great guys, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's such a great encapsulation of the whole score, the, all yeah. the heroic elements, because yeah. you have the, the, yeah. the kind of texture for his power right. uh, over the animals, you have yeah. the eagle music right. and the, the right. Beastmaster theme. All, all, they're all put, intertwined, yeah. they're all intertwined. And I think that's, th that's what you try to do in symphonic writing is it they may sound different but then you realize they're part of the same feeling that's what i i love that i love in in my heart i'm a symphonic sort of that's my background that's where i came from you know so i always go back to that well and i sit in awe of the guys that did that came before me and i say 
how dare you even let me into your room <laughs> to listen to your work much less. You know what happens to me a lot in LA? I'm sitting there and I'm writing and I think I'm doing a good job and everything and then I've got to go run an errand. I get in the car and I put on serious radio and then I say, oh, that's how you're supposed to compose music. <laughs> Uh, so do we also have the, what is the climactic the, battle the scene? The last clip is the big battle on the pyramid. Right. And that's where, where uh, Ripcorn dies. And right, right, yeah, yeah. He's just riding to the rescue where everybody gets barbecued. So we can show that and then uh, I think uh, we're going to get stuff signed, right? Yes, yeah, sure. I have a quick question. Though. Yes. I'm coming in at the tail end, so we already covered this. But that's okay. One of the tail end. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Ralph Bakshi, right. That's, must have been like the challenge of the century. That was a really difficult project to work on because of his, you know, the animation and uh, trying to fit to what he had done um, and, and make it work with his tempos. You know, I had to work literally to his cuts because the, he had already done the, the animation. It was very hard and, and uh, in a lot of cases he didn't have the rights to certain songs. Like he wanted Sinatra but he couldn't get permission to do Sinatra and we did that, that beautiful montage you know, where he gets married and it, the guy sounded like Sinatra. I forget his name, he's a studio singer here in LA. He could do Sinatra. <laughs> and you know, it was fun to do but it was hard to do. I have a funny, funny story for you guys about that, but I don't know if we have time. Oh, we got ah, time. Okay. <laughs> All right, so he wanted blue suede shoes by Elvis Presley at, towards the end of the film. Okay. I said, you know, I know all the... Pres he couldn't get the permission to use the record. I said, let's re-record it. Get the permission to do the song. We'll re-record it. We'll do it as an instrumental. I said, you know, I know the guys that worked with Presley. They're around their studio place. I'll get those guys. They went on a road with him. They know the song. We'll do it. We'll take him into the studio. We'll do Blue Suede Shoes. I said, you know, so Glenn Harden, uh, Ronnie Tott, you know, they were all the James, uh, James, I forget his name, from uh, Nashville. Good, great guitar player. Anyway, um, they were the original Presley guys. And so I took them into the studio, and we start playing Blue Suede Shoes. I said to Glenn, do we need music? No, 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 we know the song. Yeah, okay. So, you know, guys start playing it. So they start playing it. And Ralph Bakshi comes out and says, it's too slow. And we said, Ralph, these are the, these are the original guys. I'm, I'm sure they know the tempo. No, it's too slow. <laughs> well, Ralph, you know, no, it's too slow. We, we were yelling at each other. So finally, uh, we cut a track, but we, the music editor and I went to Ralph's house the next day. Okay, let's go listen to the record at your house. We'll listen to the tempo and compare it to our tempo. He had one of those old turntables. <laughs> you guys, are, you've already figured out the ending, huh? It was, pl it was playing too fast. It was like a quarter tone high. <laughs> and we're like, oh no. So the music editor had to speed up our track. <laughs> wow. But that's why he thought it was too fast. So, That'll but it, it's, it's really a brilliant film. It's a very strange film. It's kind of strange, but there's some marvelous sequences in it. And um, very eclectic, very eclectic. You know, it's supposedly a history of pop music, but. Oh, and I almost came to blows with a LA Times music critic, we'll, we'll, pop music critic, we'll leave names out. Um, we, he couldn't get uh, White Rabbit, you know, the, uh, what's her name, Grace Slick. He couldn't get that record. And he wanted it, he wanted it, he wanted it. And I said, I'll do a sound alike. He says, you can't do that. I said, oh yeah, I bet I can. <laughs> and uh, I knew this girl who sang with Eric Clapton, who toured with him, named Marcy Levy. She could do Grace Slick like that. So again, we did a takedown of the original track. I had got all the guys, got Lee Sklar, all, all the best studio session players. We went in with Marcy Levy <laughs> and we cut this track. And the LA Times pop music critic argued with me. He said, no, that's the original recording. I said, no, no, it's not. Yeah. He said, no, I, I know it when I hear it. <laughs> 
And he, he was, I thought he was going to hit me. Yeah. And I kept saying, you know, it's Marcy Levy and the studio guys. No, it's not, he said. Okay, okay whatever, whatever. <laughs> whatever you say. <laughs> uh, all right, let's watch. Oh, what, Ford? One more thing about the Beastmaster that, not, not that there aren't CDs out there for sale. Um, <laughs> there are. But you, the, the, the reason he got the gig. No, I, I, I told about that, the violin concerto, yeah. I s oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, so let's watch uh, Rip Torn finally get finally the kill, which takes pain. forever, by the way. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> gives you plenty of time to compose, because they, they stall off on killing him for, for like 10 minutes in the scene, but... To me, I remember, you know, they wanted a lot of theme through that. They said, we want to hear the theme a lot through this. And I said, okay, okay, because this cue came a little later. Uh, and I, I liked making the ultimate climactic moment when he picks up the ferret. Do you notice that that's the moment of triumph? Because that, you know, just to me, that's the thing. It's there it is, you know. That's his caring and his goodness that he has it. Yeah, that's such a tricky. I, when I was watching, I was thinking like, well, they they robbed you of the moment of of you know, uh, really celebrating no, no. the death of yeah. Rip Torn because yeah. you have to give voice to the sadness of the right. ferret right. sacrifice. Right. But I I didn't mind that in a way because uh, I thought it was nice to make the epic point really, the the picking up of the ferret and standing there. That to me is like yeah. it's like in an opera when they're, they're, that's the moment, you know. Yeah, it's funny you'd say that, because another thing I was thinking watching the film is the way Coscarelli directs yes. actors is yeah. very theatrical, like yes. it, oh, yeah. especially a lot of the early scene, you know, right. people are right. posing right. and yeah. being very yeah. declamatory. Well, and Rip Torn's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <he's laughs> I mean, you know, terrific. it's like, what a great villain to have, you know, I mean, he just milks it for whatever well, it's and worth. They, you know? they milk it, I mean, yeah. they keep yeah. cutting back and he's just kind of like, oh, no, you, know he's not, <laughs> you know he's not dead. I did, I, I made it. A, a choice for a reason that when he stabs Rip Torn, the character, it's a major chord. It's not a minor chord. Often composers like to play that. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I play it as major because to me it's like his triumph over that evil. You know, that's to me is my head is always working on those other things. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a you know that it's, when you're watching it, you know the only way to kill this guy, he has to go into the sacrificial well, you flame. Know, sooner or you, later. You watch two kids go into it. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know yeah. that's the yeah. only way to dispose of him. Yeah. So he's not yeah. going to get killed by some little knife. You know, if you watch a movie, an action movie and for some reason the establishing, establishing shot is a pit of snakes and then they go over here. You know sooner yep. or later someone's winding <laughs> yep. up in there. That's you just for sure. know that that's coming. You know? <laughs> it's like, okay, when are they going to get there? <laughs> uh, any final questions before you rush to have him sign your... Yes. I guess I was curious, you know, when you went to Rome to recall this, yes. since, you know, it was sort of the little movie, uh, in a way, and you get in, uh, maybe it's a question about like when you work with different orchestras around the world. Um, cause I'm almost curious, it's like how, you know, how, how are different things received? I mean, yeah. do you feel you were treated this seriously just based on the music, even though it was a small film? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. They gave me five days of recording with this large, large, large orchestra and it was great. I mean, and uh, the percussion guys had a blast. They kept bringing all these old gongs and things. You want to use this, you know, whatever. But um, uh, I, I was very, I loved doing it. I really loved. I had a blast conducting it because I felt like it's really this is what I like doing. You know, I love doing this kind of music, and I felt, I, I feel like because I am a classical guy that I, the way I work with an orchestra is I don't say this is n not serious music it's all serious and we we play it as well as we can and we get I get as much out of them as I can and we do it quickly because you know the clock is going and they were they were like school kids because you know that week was the uh, semi-final in Rome of the World Cup soccer and Italy won the semifinal, and they went nuts. They got so drunk. <laughs> <laughs> they came to the studio Thursday morning with dark circles. <laughs> I was, we'll just do some quiet cues this morning, you know. 
And as you know, uh, that year, 82, uh, Italy went on to win the World Cup soccer. And the loser that year was Argentina. And that was also earlier that year, Argentina had lost the Falklands War. So in September of 82, Argentina had a new government. You know, they said, look, we can lose the Falklands War, but we lost the World Cup soccer. You guys are out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm, uh, so okay, th yes, thanks to Lee oh, Holdridge. Hey. <laughs> uh, and if you have something for him to sign, please open it. Uh, don't make him open it. <laughs> <laughs> nice man. He's a strong man, but this yeah. take, take it out of him. I was stronger then. You know. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for, for this wonderful score. Thank you all. Thanks.